Today's seminar, uh, I would like to welcome every one of you and also welcome our colleagues who are uh, joining us from other locations. We believe there are, are participants from uh, in India who are uh, joining us, uh, participants from East Africa and various locations. Our own colleagues here in West Africa, um, wherever you are uh, joining in, please feel welcome to our seminar today. Today's seminar is a little unique in a couple of ways. Um, one is that it's being presented by a husband and a team that we know very well of working for them here in West Africa and also in other locations. And I will be coming back to uh, introducing them a little, a, a little later. Another aspect of what is unique in today's seminar is that uh, to the presenters, this may be like the, um, the final public activity within APSAT before they leave APSAT. And the fellow who is introducing them, him also, this is the final public activity within APSAT. So I think that is fairly unique. The presenters are calling the one introducing them is also outgoing, and so we are uh, happy that we have this moment to, to do this as people who are uh, going and living the episode. Let me come to the presenters and introduce them to you. Dr. Elba Wetzel Ratunde started as a research assistant between 1982 and 1995. Department of Pop Science, Technical University, Munich, Germany. She then became a research fellow um, at Iowa State, uh, Iowa State University. Oh, no, sorry. She then became a postdoctoral fellow, postdoctoral fellow of old reading at Iowa State University between 1986 and 1987. She then moved to India in research as a postdoctoral fellow on permanent breeding between 1987 and 1989. While at India between 1990 and 1994, she was the international associate scientist in permanent breeding, see that episode. She then became senior scientist breeding at Episode India from 1994 to 1998. Between 2001 and 2000, was a regional coordinator for EPSAT crop improvement seed system in West and Central Africa. She was also project coordinator for MT2 Project 3 for EPSAT between 2000. She was the product line coordinator CRP brand and cereals, coordinating palm millet and sorghum for WCA during the development and inception phase of the CGIR research program for brand and cereals between 2012 and 2014. And from 2015 to currently, she has been the flagship coordinator CRP Brian Serials, coordinating research on sorghum improvement and genetics within the CRP Brian and Serials. Dr. Eva became a principal scientist in 1998, where she's been in charge of sorghum breeding and genetic resources at Eglisa here, here, here in London, for the West and Central Africa region. Research at 1996, 
fellow of the World Food Institute at Iowa State University, 1986-1987, Fulbright Students Fellowship to attend Iowa State University, 1978-1979, and Student and Postgraduate Fellowship um, um, in 1975-1982. Eva speaks many language. I, many languages. I, I really envy her of this. She speaks German, her mother tongue. She speaks English, native proficiency. She speaks fluent French. She even speaks Arabic and Hindi. And basic skills in Bangalore. Um, Eva is married to Dr. Henry Fred Wilson Ratunde. They have two children, born in 1994 and 1997. And they are here, and um, she's here with us today. I'm passing a long list because of time, a long, uh, quite a lot of uh, material on Eva's uh, uh, CV, which is very impressive. But let me turn to Henry Frederick Wenzel Matunde. Hopefully not to us as Fred. Fred does English such southern breeding for Western Central Africa. He has been doing that since 1997. With experience in southern pilot and groundnut breeding, seed system development, and participatory research for dryland agricultural enhancement. Fred has created a hybrid breeding program based on photoperiod sensitive gibberous jump plasm, creating new seed plants <coughs> and discovering high levels of heterosis. He has contributed to training seed producer cooperatives, supporting national research programs, training activities, preparing training modules and publication of training materials. His seminal work on the use of local West African jump plasm and the global diversity of the guinea pigs has provided a foundation for improving West African savanna zone soils. A major focus of the characterization and use of WCA southern diversity for adaptation to low, to low phosphorus conditions have been vital for formulating appropriate breeding and agronomic strategies for the region. Fred's creation of northern Breeding populations with give less grains, due and plantical characteristics, combined with reduced height and increased stock quality, offer opportunities for making quantum improvements in grain productivity and animal feed quality of their store. His solar research in India focused on recurrent selection procedures for breeding extra early and dual purpose solar time for Indian growing conditions. Prior to EPSAT, Fred worked at the University of Hohenheim, Germany, on rye breeding methodologies. His dissertation research assessed the effectiveness of alternative mass selection procedures for population improvement of palm millet. Professionally, Fred started as a research co volunteer uh, in agricultural extension in Ecuador between 1978 and 1980. He became a research associate of uh, in the Bolt Breeding Program at Iowa State University between 1981 and 1984. Associate at Ecclesat on pine breeding between 1984 and 1988. Fred became a postdoctoral fellow while reading University of Hohenheim, Germany between 1989 and 1990, and he became an analyst reading at Episat India between 1991 and 1994. He, he rose to senior scientist position at Episat between 1995, 1994 and 1998. And from 1998 to the present, Fred has, be, has been a principal scientist, soil breeding and genetic resources, EPSAT, based here in Bamako, Mali. 
Fred has also got a few awards, just a few here uh, uh, as an example. Equistar's Best Scientific Publication Award in 2012, Resource Mobilization Award in 2000, at Equistar 2008, PACE Premium for Academic Excellence 1982 at Iowa State University, and LF Graeber Scholarship 1978 University of Wisconsin Madison. Eva, I mean, sorry, Fred, pardon me. Fred speaks English as his mother tongue. He speaks German. He speaks uh, French and elementary Spanish. And I'm sure a little bit, a few, a few, a, a little Barbara also. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen. This dear couple will today give us a seminar entitled Southern Improvement in West and Western Central Africa, Joint Learning and Progress in a Center of Crop Domestication. Could you welcome Eva and Fred? I don't know who's coming first. But... As I mentioned, just the background of germplasm, and we'll be uh, sharing uh, aspects of learning together, and then actual results, breaking it out together, and finally reaching out. And I can use this now. Thank you very much. Great. We're together. <laughs> okay. So to begin with, as a task, and that is reading, uh, improved organs. Where? Less than some of that. Uh, where a organ has been grown for thousands of years where we're in a center of crop domestication, uh, where there's a tremendous diversity of crops. Uh, in 2025 varieties of sorghum being grown. So within each household, you can find several varieties being grown. This diversity is not just random development by uh, individuals, but rather it's the systematic use of the genetic diversity by farmers to uh, minimize risk, to maximize productivity in the complex environments that they have. Uh, and so this is really quite, a, quite an opportunity, quite a challenge. It's a, it's a crop that is a stable crop, which means what? Well, of course, it is a major portion of the, the diet, but it's also the basis of agricultural systems, and it's really uh, a key part of the culture being developed here by the farmers. Uh, it's seen and thought of as a man's crop, a men's crop, because it is the man's responsibility for providing the cereal for the main meal. But increasingly, it is also important for income. Women also are growing sorghum uh, as extra food and as income. Um, children, for nutrition, the children's diets are so based on sorghum and chromium that their iron and zinc content, micronutrient nutrition, is dependent on these cereals, sorghum and millet. Uh, another reason that sorghum is a, a staple crop, is that it can produce in a uh, reliable manner in the diverse environments and also in the very challenging environments. And uh, one aspect that we'll come to later is that of poor soil fertility. And that sorghum can produce a dependable crop under poor soil conditions, whereas certain other cereals like maize uh, will fail, can fail. And finally, a seed produce crops, sorghum, a crop that has uh, been uh, domesticated here and is also a basis for the diet, for survival, for life, has moral obligations. And seed, as for seed, there's a moral obligation to give seed because you cannot morally refuse something that someone needs for survival. So, interesting that 
the context of this crop is very rooted in the region and where we are. So, next slide, please. Next slide. Cultivated across the swath of West Africa, West and Central Africa, and that actually represents, as we see here, in the length of growing period from uh, our colleague Pierre uh, a tremendous range uh, of environments. In each hundred kilometers, north or south, you will be in a different environment. And one aspect, uh, besides the length of the growing period, is also uh, the with uh, African savanna being characterized by variability of the onset of the rains, as well as with farming systems of when farmers will actually plant sorghum. Covering it can cover a two-month period, even with the same. But the last rainfall and the available moisture in the soil are narrow, restricted state. And in this situation, we would grow a photoinsensitive variety of sorghum, one that does not respond to the photo period. If we saw it early, it would flower in the midst of the rains. There would be grain mold, there would be bird damage, there would be no grain to harvest. If we harvest it late, if we, excuse me, if we sow it late here, the flowering will happen too late so that there will not be enough moisture for filling grain. So a lot of risk. A photo variety, however, you can sow it at all of these times, and we have flowering occurring almost at the same time period, and we have resilience. We have adaptation and we will have a harvest. Another aspect of the, the context, the soils. Uh, okay. Uh, the, here is a map of uh, available soil phosphorus, plant available soil phosphorus. Uh, and the color here would be at the sufficiency level. Everything that is half yellow to yellow is below 10 parts per million, which is considered to be the threshold for uh, sufficiency for sorghum. And you can see the extensiveness of deficiency. Next slide, please. Uh, the germplasm. Um, we have here a diversity of the major races. There are all of the major races except for Kaffir, which is in southern Eastern Africa, being grown here. And next slide, please. Uh, the Guinea race is the predominant race that is cultivated in the Sudanian zone of West Africa, which is characterized to be and then in range for photoperiod sensitivity, but it is the race that has the most photoperiod sensitivity. Drooping panicles, open blooms, hard grain, traits that really provide resilience, adaptation to a range of insect mold complex, etc. Well adapted to low produces yield under these conditions. Uh, on farm, one ton per hectare is the average currently. And this is the background. This is what uh, we are using the Guinea race germplasm, the local materials, as the foundation for the breeding because it has this portfolio of uh, adaptation traits. But we're not responsible just to that germplasm. Here we have a genetic marker uh, diversity uh, characterization of the parents used for creating the across the association mapping, the BC num populations. And as you can see, uh, unfortunately, the bottom is not there, but uh, Guinea is in green, uh, dark green, 
in, in that green, we have, and this is Dura in that green, we have Clavetum, which would be in blue, and in purple are red materials, which are basically interracial mixed. And you can see that we have as donors contributing 25% to uh, the genetic background in these populations, covering really a wide diversity of materials, creating new diversity in nutrient combinations. And with that, I'd like to hand over. <laughs> I have to learn something. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, thanks a lot for coming. Um, yeah, the approach that we have used for improving to, uh, to move forward with those challenges that Fran has explained is very much. And here are just a few photos and uh, one graphic this, uh, pre representation of the different group types of groups we have been working with in terms of organizations, but also in terms of background and in terms of profession. Um, so as you can see, we have been working a lot with farmers, learning from farmers and that what Fred has presented is actually results of that learning together. Um, Okay. So, uh, our learning has been focused on improving the efficiency of the plant breeding program. You can characterize any plant breeding program uh, by uh, subdividing it in five major stages. What's commonly done uh, in universities and teaching stages of plant breeding are uh, usually separated into three different aspects. One is to assemble diversity required, what Fred also just presented. Um, conducting the selection of creating new genotypes uh, for testing and evaluation, and then the actual testing and evaluation process for identification of new varieties. However, this process, and a lot of research has been done on optimizing these technical processes, there has been very little theoretical work on actually how and how to set priorities for this kind of process and how to actually disseminate seeds and how to plan for this in an organized manner that this aspiration process for the breeding program. Two main reasons. There is no point in running a breeding program if you don't have a way to disseminate the benefit from the seed that you are, from the varieties that you are creating there is no need to run the program. So the seed work is absolutely essential for the success of any kind of breeding program. And I think you are very much aware of this and the discussion about this is ongoing. Um, you cannot optimize and improve efficiency if you don't know where you're going. So it's absolutely essential to know the direction, to be able to say, this is what I'm trying to improve and that way you can improve the efficiency of getting there. So this theoretical framework has one, been one of the outputs of our work together, not just our own, but uh, much largely with the participatory research, uh, network on research and gender analysis. So just as a summary, what are some of the target traits that we have identified based on our work with farmers, based on our work with other partners? Um, no surprise, uh, farmers of course are interested to produce yield. Um, but yield, same yield the law doesn't really mean very much because it's kind of a zero common. Uh, what's important uh, to understand here in this context is that it's actually yield A for the farm unit so that it have the requirements of the family are met. Much more important than hectare yields tend to be labor yields per unit of work. If people decide about a crop of variety of management practice so that it fits into their work calendar, land availability here is much less of a problem than labor availability on the farm. And that was a big learning for us. It's not at all part of way of operating of this agriculture scientist trained in the West. And of course the input is and the yield per use of input is another critical matter that farmers are actually learning about for certain money variables. Um, 
The other way of looking at yields is because in the end, because these are staple crops, what counts is that the family has enough to eat from what they grow. And so, um, one of course the first step there is that uh, what do the panicles and losses in the process of, of, of threshing and, and preparing for storage. The yeah, of course, part of it is also storability. The next important step for sorghum is because here it is very often decorticated. It's high decortication yields. The decortication process is 30%. And so if your improved variety has higher losses than the local variety, all your improved yield is going to decortication. <coughs> and that's actually what happened with quite a few of the old improved varieties that have been released for calibration earlier. So some of the issues that we're grappling with is how to actually measure meal per kilogram of grain. Our cooks are getting there, and at least we are getting an assessment by the farmers of this capacity. There's also the issue of actually looking at nutrient yield, especially micronutrients like iron and zinc, because of the very high levels of malnutrition service elements in the populations here. And you trade. I think everybody has discussed and you had some fields are not going to determine in stock quality. Um, just to give you a gist of the kind of data and uh, kind of results uh, we have been getting from these kind of discussions when farmers are evaluating varieties, that wherever you see some stars, we found significant gender differences for the appreciation of specific varieties for that trait. So you can see here, the trade model for variety evaluation by farmers. You also see that women evaluate the same varieties and with the same criteria for suggestions. Um, I just wanted to highlight the iron and zinc loss uh, by recortification here as a really <coughs> challenge opportunity for disseminating technology to use whole grain of soil for preparation of of meals using many technology that we have um, developed with the nutritionist who works with us. As you can see, this is iron content in whole grain, and this is decorticated mechanically with the machine. This is iron content in manually decorticated grain. Almost half of iron is gone in the normal procedure that we would use to prepare sorghum. So this is, if we're also trying to breed, to, to double the content, oops, sorry, to double the content of iron would be much harder, I think, than to improve actually the use, encourage people to use hard, um, and that way have to a lot more iron using the project. Oops. So I will hand over to Fred who will talk about what we actually did in terms of reading. <laughs> Very good, thank you. And uh, Again, the same slide we have that this is really results coming from community of practice with EcoSat and uh, partners outside of EcoSat. Uh, and first of all, actually the, the methodology uh, that we are pursuing that really is critical for making gains. And that is, first of all, that the selection we are doing, selection of progenies, is being done in the target environments in the target zone. Uh, also that we are testing in multiple environments. Uh, as any of you were here from my earlier seminar uh, in November, I believe it was, uh, the complexity of environments and the important uh, interaction of varieties with environments to actually make progress for grain yield, which is the number one priority for farmers. We can't do it in one or two research stations. We need multiple environments. Uh, and uh, certainly, <coughs> phosphorus, testing it on high phosphorus on station is one way that we can uh, proceed in uh, sampling the important environmental variation. With crop management, that we have the synergy that it's not just breeding and not just agronomy, but we can have the two together. And certainly involving farmers in the breeding process is critical for making gains. So, 
our selection process, it involves a network, uh, national programs, farmers, national programs, for achieving this uh, approach that I just presented. For farmer participatory selection, it's not one uh, method, but really it's a, a toolbox, a, a whole range of these. Farmers love to do single plant selections by base populations. The product in their hand, they have a mental index of the different traits and the economic weight of each of those traits. And they love to go ahead. This is for generating new families, new lands. In large nurseries, or even on farm, farmers tend to be scoring in different lines <coughs> based on the traits that are the most important to them, that they see that they value. Uh, so that would be the initial on-farm nursery evaluations, as well as coming on station and scoring nurseries on station. Then yield testing, which is really the need. Uh, we have first initial yield testing, which now is locally called the 32 variety trials. Uh, the 32 varieties total being tested with uh, yield evaluations as well as scoring and culinary testing being done. With researcher involvement, but farmers are planting, managing, and evaluating the trials. And then from that, varieties are identified and go into the next stage of testing, which is uh, more farmer managed, less researcher involvement the adaptation testing with three to five varieties and typically including economic practice, comparisons, farmer practice and improved practice. And specific uh, targeted trials for women for their conditions and then it is feasible for them as well as for men. Here just to give you an idea of participatory variety trials, this would be the, the first stage test in the 30 trials managed by farmers and scored by farmers, but with strong researcher involvement, national program and EGOSAT. And here would be a, an example of a feedback that was in Bambara. Uh, the names of the varieties here, here's the village. Within the village, it would be the two farmers connecting the trial per village. And here is the yield, which is 100 kilo sacks, which is a unit that farmers can recognize. And you yeah. had the color coded three colors from the average, one standard deviation above, or one standard deviation below, giving farmers a chance to look across trials, across uh, villages for the same variety. And then the bottom, which is not visible, unfortunately, there's the mean of the trial yield, as well as an estimate confidence the data, which actually farmers look at and understand. And this feedback table will be used by farmers in choosing, together with feedback from the, the scoring, which varieties they're wanting to take into seed production, which varieties to include in the culinary testing, etc. And here are one slide, at least, with results from participatory testing. Um, this would be in the bottom bit it has a different villages, so this is environmental mean yield. If you can please scroll down. Uh, okay. Uh, and you can see the range of yield that we have in the on-farm trials, and it's something that we could not get from on-station testing. We have a range, we have a population of environments in which we are able to observe the performance of our varieties. And we have here one variety coming from population, nafali, with superiority of yield across the range of conditions compared to not one but two local checks in red, table A, which is the variety that is in seed production, dissemination, appreciated, excellent variety, and in black it's the local, uh, or blue, the farmer's local variety. So we can make progress, we are making progress, and with this farmer participatory yield testing, we can actually assess performance across a population of environments, which is necessary and exciting. 
I showed at the beginning the soil map for West Africa with available plant phosphorus. So that's at a geographic level, but what does it mean for individual farmers? Because a farmer is not <laughs> a state or a country, but in their field. And here we have just results of uh, about, if you can scroll down, please, at the bottom, they're always missing. Uh, available plant phosphorus in 90 farmers fields. Uh, and a photo where we can see the effect of a termite mound and the growth that is possible if there's nutrients available and the type of growth that you do see in farmers fields where there's lack of nutrients. And here we have the plant available phosphorus in parts per million 10 being the, the threshold for sufficiency. Above 10, there should be sufficient phosphorus available for plants. Sorghum, sorghum growth, below insufficient. And we can see that the majority of farmers' fields, farmers' fields in here Maui are below the uh, sufficiency level. And if we look at the color, uh, this uh, orange is men's field and the blue is women's fields. So we now have below 10 parts per million, but we also have a gender issue with women, as we know, having fields at the end of the rotation when the fertility is low, but it shows in the phosphorus availability, it's really an issue. And what does phosphorus mean? Deficiency of phosphorus. Here, the same variety uh, with application of phosphorus and without application of phosphorus, same level of nitrogen. Without phosphorus, there's a delay in growth. Same date of sowing, but there can be a few days to three weeks delay in growth, which is really an issue for resilience. Also, reduction in growth, plant height, we can see here, but of course, yield. We have in our long term on, our on station testing. Yields of one half, 50%, with the same nitrogen but without phosphorus compared to it with application of phosphorus. And what variation do we have, first of all, in our uh, varieties currently available? Uh, through evaluation of a panel of breeding, uh, breeding bread varieties, farmers, land race varieties, everything put together, we found that there is significant genetic variation for adaptation to low phosphorus conditions. Here, we actually have, this is all on station work, collaborative IR ecosat, and we actually have here uh, plotted, this is grain yield going from 75 kilos per, 75 uh, grams per meter squared, or uh, 750 kilos per hectare, up to uh, two and a half times 750 kilos per hectare. Plotted against, this is actually soil phosphorus, available phosphorus level on the research station. And we see that there is a response, there is variation for the response. In particular, the land race varieties did have superior adaptation to low phosphorus in this variety, IS15401 Sumanamba, with specific adaptation to low phosphorus. A source parental material for improving adaptation of low phosphorus. And up, voila, not filling the same bread I presented from the on-farm testing. It has superior performance, and in fact, it was found to have both higher uptake of phosphorus as well as higher phosphorus use efficiency. So these are exciting results. Based on these test uh, results and analysis over multiple years, we have uh, identified varieties, parental materials, to use in creating new breeding populations, randomizing broad-based populations with adaptation for low phosphorus condition, which is then feeding material into the breeding program. Another uh, trait, if you will, of interest and of tremendous potential to pursue, and that is uh, stover quality. Uh, with planted on the same date, of course, uh, different genetic materials can have very different heights. But what does different heights mean? Uh, 
it means basically uh, the same interval lengths. Same number of leaves with a longer interval, you're going to have taller height. But there's also uh, uh, nutritional consequences of having a long interval compared to a short interval, as you can see here. If you can scroll down, please. And that being that uh, the longer interval materials have lower digestibility, higher lignification. The plants, they stand up well. They don't fall down. They're fantastic. Fantastic for fuel material, for building material, but not for animals to eat. Um, and here we have predictions of digestibility and interval length. Yellow is TFLA, the local variety, say C3, T5, which is at the lowest. And here we have progenies from the new crop, uh, uh, breeding population, broad based population. We have diversity for silver quality that can be exploited and used to create a new crop, a dual purpose grain plus fire. And another aspect of uh, opportunity to pursue and to deliver to farmers. Uh, for the priority traits for grain yield would be hybrid breeding uh, with parents that are based on local germ pests that have the array of adaptation traits required that have grain quality that will provide resilience will provide yield benefits uh, as well as the motor for the seed systems that are developing and strengthening uh, and I'm, okay, you're, looks like we're scrolling down to the next slide. Um, and so we're sort of out of sync. We have the bottom of the next slide. But anyways, don't, okay, so, uh, and the uh, results of the no, 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 the results that we have from on station testing and now as well from diverse on farm testing show that the hybrids are able to deliver yield superiorities over local varieties on farm conditions. Here, the results from the ARDP project uh, with quarter hectare plots of the local variety next to the farmer variety, and you can see the same 40% yield superiority of the hybrids over the local varieties in large plots on farm as the same results we had gotten from our research station test. So it really is a technology that can deliver benefit to farmers that we are in the process with the team, uh, you said, in ours uh, of pursuing. And then we can continue, Ava, if you will, the next time, please. Okay, so now a few words about how to reach out, how to move uh, forward how to actually uh, make sure that the work we are doing has benefit to farmers. So just one picture here of actually a cooperative, I think the one cooperative that we actually had a hand in creating, other cooperatives were already there and we are working with them. So we have invested a lot of effort actually in building capacity of farm organizations. Yes, for the breeding process, what Fred already discussed a little bit, but more so for the seed dissemination over the last uh, several years. Um, and so there's a lot of research gone into actually understanding how seed gets disseminated traditionally so that we can build on processes that farmers are familiar with. And we're building capacity, of course, technically <coughs> for seed production, um, but lately have been putting a lot more emphasis on actually building capacity for very basic um, business management skills. Seed setting is not part of the culture. So seed setting itself is a big learning um, for all people involved in the process of disseminating seed. So um, one other area that we've been working on uh, over the years is rather than training a lot of technicians to work with farmers on farm, training actually farmers in the villages to become like facilitators, animators in their own communities for, for innovation, for testing new things and for dissemination in the end as well. Um, the big advantage is you train a technician, he's good, he'll be gone. 
If you have a good trauma, you change, then you have an impact. Um, so this is just one example of the growth of seed production and seed dissemination from one of the partner organizations, and this is an example from Burkina Faso. Um, so you can see um, that initially seed production was very low. We increased the number of varieties, it went up a little bit, and with increasing demands and increasing the risk, we are now in ranges that really make a difference to people who, who live in that area. So with 120 tons of seed in one, uh, this is in Kaya area of Burkina, then these are measurable numbers of hectares that are getting sold uh, with seed of new varieties. I mentioned already that selling seed is not part of farmers' culture here at all, and buying seed not even. So one way to facilitate and create experience with sale and purchase uh, of what that we developed really under the whole project was to sell very small packets, not just small packets, but many packs of 100 grams seed, sometimes only 50 grams, so that nobody can feel like inhibited of I'm getting seed because I don't have any. It's really people can buy the experiment, but they want to do themselves. We, we got the idea actually because we were overwhelmed by the requests for trials. After a few years of running these adaptation trials, we could not manage the number of requests that we got. So we reverted this strategy of enlarging the testing to actually starting as a selling experience as well. And in this way, uh, tens of thousands of seed packets were sold. The demand for larger size packets is now very strong, but the, the organizations who are selling seed are still using it when they introduce new varieties. So it's really become a marketing tool uh, for the farmers and producers for selling seed. And another interesting uh, side effect of selling the very small packets is that it's really attractive to women because it's cheap. Women often grow sorghum as an intercrop in their ground field, so they actually don't need very much seed. Having a small packet, that then becomes accessible to them. And we've had even experiences where one woman bought one packet of 100 grams of seed and shared it with her neighbors. <laughs> Quite regularly. So, um, but we didn't only work on disseminating seed. As we have mentioned, we've been working a lot on crop production technologies, and one area that we have been involved seriously is the integrated strigans approach, getting away from research on technologies to construct striga to a system whereby farmers can actually learn and adapt, combine the technologies that work for that. And so a lot of this work was led by Tom Adam, um, and has translated into Finally, a set of videos available for very large scale dissemination, and I think you are all quite aware of this. So I will not go into great details. Um, I want to talk a little bit more actually on our work on strengthening institutional capacity. I mentioned already our work on uh, capacity building with farmer organizations with <coughs> their own capacity. Uh, similarly, a point and very effective is to link farmer organizations among themselves. For example, uh, this is just one example from a cooperative in Tominia, has, been very, has very successful relationships now with the cooperatives not very far across the border in Burkina, exchanging seeds, exchanging varieties, and one doesn't work because both work in areas that are risky, so they've, they've exchanged tonnages of seed. Um, they are also exchanging experiences about marketing, exchanging experiences about managing equipment, and experiences about how to improve local sales. Um, another linkage, of course, is to make sure that different farm organizations have a good relationship with the nearby researchers. So for these people, for example, Sanzana is an important uh, anchor point. Uh, those linkages are now regular. These farm organizations will go to Sanzana if they have a need for specific things, or work with a company <coughs> that works with Sanzana or with private seed companies. So putting the farm organization, the seed producers, in linkage, in contact 
with other stakeholders in the suit arena or value chain, as we just say. Um, this has been also very much a regional effort. It's just one example of one workshop where everybody who came put a needle in the area where they had on farm trials. <laughs> so, um, unfortunately, the, actually, the one picture that Fred had was from the site, and it was overrun by Boko Haram um, in this village last year. So, um, anyway, but we are still having partnerships with many of the same organizations. Um, so, just to sum up, what are some of the key outcomes of this kind of work? is that uh, we are now have working in Mali alone with some 30 cooperatives and then several in Burkina and Niger on seed production and seed dissemination sales. The videos have been watched by thousands of people and been shown on television in several countries, so millions of people have seen them in local languages. Um, we have actually invested a lot of effort in training radio stations recently to collaborate with the uh, seed producer organizations for the dissemination purpose. And uh, of course, there's lots of soon training. Um, the profitability data we didn't show, but they're there. <laughs> so, from habits are actually really uh, more profitable for farmers to grow. And it was very nice, a special moment yesterday, we had one farmer cooperative visit us to say goodbye. and. Um, I just asked whether they had any feedback from their seed buyers. And the first thing he said, Madame, les humains et vite, c'est bon top. So I think that was a very <laughs> comforting statement that that was the first thing that he has to say when I asked him about the seed set. So um, I just want to highlight here that I feel some of the elements of success of a program like this are really um, we had the advantage of going coming here very ignorant and learning from farmers and I think it's been a very big benefit and we've gotten the feedback and when this problem is in that line that asking a lot of stupid questions can help everybody to see more clearly what's actually important where we can make a change and what could uh, be the future um, of course, working in the context and staying in the context, working on priorities with a big team with, with to get long-term support from some key donors so that we can carry uh, work over more than three years. And uh, yes, thanks to our partnership and the good collaboration here at Samongo. Thank you very, very much, uh, my friend, for such a very illustrious and wonderful uh, presentation. Um, we've taken the whole one hour we had uh, assigned for this seminar, but we can probably assign about 10 minutes of questions. Um, and I think um, we will uh, also be looking out on that board there for questions coming in from other locations so that we don't dominate the questions. Okay. So questions, uh, yes. Uh, Evan, thank you very much for sharing your experiences of about uh, 18 years of uh, working here in Mali. Uh, I'm sure that what you have just presented uh, reflects the outcome and the impact on the field. Uh, we hope that people will agree on what you have achieved so that we can make more impact. Uh, to Eva, I wanted to ask you, what is the biggest challenge that you can tell us about breeding, working with the farmers and the partners in the particular approach that you have, you have for our business time? What, what, what do you see as the biggest challenge in Australia we have encountered during the 18 years? Uh, Fred, uh, the work on protein and uh, and he is really quite interesting. Did you see, did you look at the factors that are making some of the materials more adapted to grow here? Like the wood morphology or 
Provided the slides that I had shown with the low Mackey. And uh, he had actually done uh, what was called shovelomics with a shovel, looking at root uh, density, uh, root angle, root. <laughs> okay, and very limited. There's some association, but it's not major. We also did very extensive and published. Uh, and uh, phosphorus uptake, phosphorus use efficiency parameters, several. And yes, there's genetic variation for these traits, but there's no single mechanism that is really determined. And actually, it's, it's basic survival, and so it's probably like uh, the spaceship uh, technology that you have to have built in redundancy, that there are many systems, many mechanisms. And just what's interesting is the West African sorghum materials compared to maize. Uh, there is interaction between variety and phosphorus level. But we have a level of adaptation in all of the materials you can see. Uh, we can push the envelope. We can uh, achieve greater adaptation. But really, Sort of is something special compared to maize. The results are different from maize. It means you have real uh, major possibilities. But there are differences for sure that are important for farmers and that we need to take into consideration for the breeding program and a lot of work uh, that is ongoing with the students uh, in fact, with Cosette, uh, looking at the selection methodology and how can we maximize genetic gains in which selection <coughs> environments? There's real opportunity and real need to, to continue to pursue that. Everyone to add something on that? No, that is okay. fine. Um, I wanted to, I'm thinking about what to say about the time discussion. Um, maybe the challenges uh, for the participatory work, of course there are always many challenges, but I, might, I first want to say that it is much less challenging in West Africa than in India. Much, much less. Because people talk to each other. So it's been wonderful uh, to have that experience and uh, be able to work in a, in a cultural context where everybody talks to everybody else. Um, that's the basis uh, for this kind of work. And I think, I think in the end, the biggest challenge is the continuity of funding so that partnerships can actually grow. And, uh, but even that, I think we actually have been very successful in overcoming, and I hope that that will be possible to continue. Because there is really a network of people uh, now that are part of the process, that see the benefits for themselves in being involved and moving the agenda forward. And while I'm talking, I want to actually um, uh, talk quickly about the question that Alistair has posed here. How are we reconciling the differences between men and women uh, preferences in the breeding program? Um, one aspect is, of course, to understand, to try first to understand what these differences really mean, also in terms of variety. Uh, for example, the question of food yield. Women will look more carefully on those kinds of traits, but in the end, they are also important for men. So if it's like that, then I take that woman, that take the woman as a specialist for evaluation of those traits because she has more, it's more important to her than the man. So that's one way to reconcile. The other thing is, of course, that we don't breed only one variety. We have organizations so that we see of only one variety. So there will be always a range of varieties available that uh, different people can use for different purposes. And it's important to, that it's those varieties are characterized well, so people who want to use them can make an informed choice. What are the advantages, what are the disadvantages? Okay, another question by Alastair is how important is early maturity for higher yeah. yeah. 
question. Maybe just a general response to that question. We talked about the photosensitivity. The flowering date is the main adaptation trait. If the body doesn't flower at the right time, for cereals for sure, maybe grommets a little different when you can harvest it when the rains are still there. But for sorghum, because you have to have rain filling after the major rains are over and also after the wild grass is already flowering so that the birds have something else to eat. Um, so for sorghum, flowering date is the absolute major adaptation trait. If you don't, if the variety doesn't flower at the right time, uh, the chances of losing the yield are very high. So it can be earliness, it can be lateness that are important. It depends on what you compare it to. Um, so yeah, everybody here likes to talk about early varieties, but early varieties can mean a lot of things to different people. So. Yes. Okay, my question is that uh, one of your slides you said uh, late sowing has some risk problem because of maturity issues and the latter days. And my question is have you looked at improving uh, the soil moisture condition to enable the amount of crops to mature in the, in the later days? Uh, no, we have not looked, we have not worked on. So I'm not sure what capacity at all that we would be very happy to have others experts <laughs> and to follow up on that. But we, what we have looked at is uh, the response to phosphorus, which is actually a major issue. And those varieties that are uh, poorly adapted to low phosphorus conditions, whose maturity is delayed because of low phosphorus, the same variety with the same amount of of moisture in the soil, if it is because of low phosphorus conditions uh, flowering two weeks later, it can be really in jeopardy of not being green because of lack of water, of being eaten by uh, raising by animals, etc. So that's one thing. And the other thing, just regarding maturity with photoperiod sensitivity, uh, a given variety set does its photoperiod sensitive. If you plant it early, it will have a long cycle, if you plant it later, it reduces its vegetative growth so that it still flowers at the same time and matures at that time. So that's really uh, uh, This system has been developed by farmers through selection over thousands of years and for adaptation to the Okay, before we play this answer, there's a question there from Paul in Ghana, Paul uh, Tanzuville. In WCA, mage and herbals constrain productivity of things are two varieties there. Genesis <laughs> and uh, yeah, varieties, respectively. Would you say you made satisfactory progress in addressing this in your breeding work over a period? Um, I would say. Um, in some ways, here in, here in Mali, the mish problem is actually not such a pervasive problem. So we haven't had a really problem of blessing, which is a selection criteria. Uh, but we've identified writers that have very good levels of resistance. So those writers are just, And there has been actually research on uh, marker identification for mish resistance done in India and, and somewhere else. So markers actually for transferring and some of the major resistance sources into breeding material available. But we have here not done it because in the areas where we are working primarily, it's not much of an issue. And um, for the headbox, I agree with uh, Paul that the guineas are still as susceptible as the cordatums. So um, it's maybe related to flowering day, but the later flowering guineas actually do not have a uh, headbox problem uh, very precisely. What's interesting is the Ipsen entomologists who used to work here before we came and continued on working on some of the caudate and breeding material on the buttons. He came and visited uh, like 10 years after his departure from here and was very surprised that the head population itself here on the station has completely changed. So even the change in the germplasm has had a, as a consequence a change in the insect population on the station. 
Okay. I will very quickly then go back to others. Thank you, Fred. Two questions for Fred. One is already about photovoltaic sensitivity. In other it's very important here to maintain in West Africa a part of environments. But our views is that against utilizing your food growing season with a high yielding, good potential variety rather than indigenous variety. I mean, don't you think this sort of conservative approach focusing on minimizing risk rather than maximizing yield or yield? My second question is about your lessons, experiences working on Zorgan for the last 17 years here in Western Central Africa, as well as in India. Because I have been working on Zorgan for the last 30, 17 years, and we know that Zorgan yield still remains low, around 1 to 1 hectare. And you have suggested some of the efforts, I mean, the not environment, Feed breeding, dual purpose breeding, hybrid breeding. What do you think will be the game changer to jumpstart genetic gain in Sorghum so that we'll have a higher yield in Africa? I mean, we know in the developed products, it is about 5 to 6 ton, and in fact, sometimes it's 8 ton. So, what's the game changer? Thank you so much for asking, and uh, and I will just give a few words, but I think we'll need to talk <laughs> after the seminar. First of all, a photoperiod sensitivity, uh, it actually is actually the system that enables a single variety to use the full available crop in its season. It's not only conservative, but it is actually because you can plant whenever and it will flower at the right time and mature at the right time. And then we can talk more later. Regarding uh, Game Changer, I would actually see uh, the seminar that we presented, the, the approach in its entirety is that answer to your question. It's not one thing, but it, it requires, as Ava had in the the different breeding stages. It requires all of these elements. Without one, you're going to be not having a chance. Uh, so, yes, the hybrids for yield, definitely. But with the seed system, with the appropriate targeting, it, so it really is, it's a, a unity. I don't know if anyone wants to add any other words, but We'd be happy to talk more. <laughs> okay, let's address the Saskia question there, which is very close to really what I had in mind. But let's deal with Alastair's question first. Does the future for sorghum in the BCA lie with hybrids? <laughs> which is also more than what I think. Maybe one first answer to that. Um, as we said, just the president said now, hybrids, of course, are new to seeds. If you cannot disseminate hybrid seed, uh, then hybrids are not the answer. And uh, in this case, I think uh, to make hybrid seed viable in the present situation when there is no private sector really active, and farmers are not ready actually to buy from private sector, I mean, there is a plenty of discussion we can have about that. Uh, so farmers are ready to buy seeds from somebody they know. Um, I think in that way, hybrids are the answer in areas where the percentage of area sold to circle is relatively high. Um, so that a local seed cooperative has enough market in the area that they can normally physically service, where they can, you know, where their personal relationship is still be So I think that's maybe one way to 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 decide whether hybrids could be the answer. The other area is, of course, that you have to be technically able to produce the seed. So um, it's more likely that you will be doing this in the Sudan savanna, less so in the Sanyaling savanna, production maybe much higher, 
although you could possibly develop systems of consistency for the South, but then you end up with this that we've talked about at length. So um, we that the hybrid effort is really more successful in Sudan Savannah, which to me is also already, I mean, for us this has been the priority target area. Uh, for one main reason, it is the area where sorghum is the most important crop for farmers and where there's actually been the least investment in breeding because all the breeding of sorghum has been focused on early sorghums that are not adapted. Okay, thank you. That's very close to really what I had in mind because, again, ever I'm afraid you know this very well, within the whole project, we have been challenged that um, uh, scientists, and not just ICRIS and scientists, but scientists in general, ICRIS and, and the national program, scientists are pushing hybrids when the system on the ground is not ready and able to sustain hybrid seed production. And uh, you, you've had that, uh, those sentiments, I'm sure. And uh, the, the question has been, do we really mean there are plans for dryland hybrids or dryland cereals uh, in, in, in West Africa, where the system is not strong enough to really sustain? Who needs them? Who produce the seeds? Who buy the seeds? And so on and so forth. And, and, uh, just, I think we, you saw some, this one graph on seed uh, production and sales. The seed is being produced, the seed is being sold. Um, my answer to your overall question is, so you've seen the list of priority traits. Grain yields is number one, and grain yield gains have not been there for farmers, for sort of previously. So we had, for example, the data of Napoleon variety that's averaged 10 or 15 percent yield gain. That's a line out of the population, and that kind of yield gain we can maintain. But 10, 15 percent, even 20 percent are very visible to a farmer who works at a long-term meal level. It's one bag more than maybe what he expects. So is that significant for him? Usually not. Whereas if he gets three or four bags more, it is. And so to me, it's really <coughs> an issue that with the hybrids, we actually have a technology where farmers are saying, please, you know, before, so it will tell you the so called the bottle is funny. Those things you cannot put fertilizer on soil, you don't get any returns. Whereas with the hybrids, this is happening. So I think that way, um, in the environment where, this, where fertilizer use is, uh, you know, reliably profitable, hybrids, I think, definitely have a future. And I think we are also having it. Seems to be working. But what's the essence? Okay, there's one additional word as well is value. Not only yields, but also total value and the opportunity for having dual or multiple purpose varieties now. With the fire body, the sweet sorghum with multiple uses, but that also is something that's uh, hybrid or non-hybrid is really something that farmers can see. Farmers are selecting in the participatory testing across the board for fire quality traits. We are running 30 minutes beyond the time we have to ask. So, if it's burning, I will accept. If it's burning, <laughs> it's really burning. You are the last. Okay, uh, I just want to ask a question. Uh, if you have a plan or a suggestion for us to document uh, in a scientific way the impact of your work on the Okay, great. Okay, before you answer, <laughs> you are so <laughs> I'm being kind to you. <laughs> okay, because of the adoption, uh, one thing is to disseminate the new life. Another thing is to facilitate the adoption of this activity. The government will be what are the main recommendations to facilitate the large adoption of this activity to more success. I mean, there's always a lot of aspects of livelihood that are not easy to document. But there is actually an impact assessment that has been done. The study is being revised and hopefully will be published. Um, so there are some initial data also on early adoption. Um, and so 
there is that impact study that was done. There was a study done by the McKnight Foundation, which used the C project as a case study model that looked more broadly, especially on impacts on the farm organization. And I can show that. Um, so, of course, there's lots of other impacts that haven't been documented. Challenges for you, for us, and so. And I think definitely issues worth looking at, especially with use of programming. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, really a great conference. Thank you all very much. I'd like to, before I hand over to the director. Yes! <laughs> Hi, Stefania, how are you? Thank you very much, Stefania. Um, we got most of uh, your very kind words, and we appreciate that very much. And I don't know whether Fred or ever want to just. We all say thank you very much, and uh, I'm sure we'll be meeting. We'll definitely be meeting when we are in Nairobi. Thank you so much. It has been a great working with you. Ladies and gentlemen, on a personal note, it has been a really big pleasure, pleasure uh, serving as the chair of this um, monthly seminars. Uh, I called the director this morning and I said, are you going to chair today's, today's also? And he told me, no, you are still on the job. <laughs> <laughs> but I think my job now ends today. <laughs> Thank you very, very much. Um, he will be appointing the next coordinator of this uh, seminars, and uh, it has been a pleasure. Thank you all very much. Yeah, I think I should start by thanking the uh, master of ceremonies. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I like the way the uh, series of people wants to make sure that it doesn't miss anything. But he's a very meticulous person in terms of details. Uh, George, really on behalf of all of us, would like to thank you for being one of the uh, promoters of these seminars. And uh, we hope that when you'll be visiting Bamako, uh, 
finally of something that is on the last one that you will still be joining us. And if we see you around, we're going to still ask you to share. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you. But uh, Fred and Eva, we have an all of you that I mean, so I think we were supposed to be going, I don't know, to the old conference uh, room now, yeah. or maybe the VIP, but somebody will direct us. So we'll have the opportunity for those of you who want to say something about uh, these three gentlemen. I am not to say gentlemen, there's no problem. <laughs> just one. <laughs> one so but, uh, thank you for this very uh, informative seminar. And we hope that we'll have an opportunity to continue to exchange with you your uh, experiences. And your so once again, thank you very much. And we'll Let's be straight to the Thanks, I hope that was I did it. Just, yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but what this thing is, I don't know. Is it the, the computer that is getting old? Is it the computer that is getting old? It's the computer that is getting old. It's the